follow such uh, amazing speak, uh, speakers. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, robotics. Uh, let's see here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes, we okay, see perfect. That. perfect. Uh, so here are my disclosures. Um, and so for those people that are uh, in the United States, I will be talking about some off-label uh, applications. Um, so in terms of our objectives today, uh, we'll talk about the motivation about why we'd be interested in robotics. Uh, and we'll talk about some advanced applications for robotics and spine. We'll talk about percutaneous T lift as it relates to uh, Kanban's triangle. We'll talk about advanced spinal pelvic fixation, uh, and we'll introduce the concept of the transfacet uh, T lift. Uh, so, if we look at ro a robot, uh, if you look by definition, it should be a machine that resembles a human being. And so, that's not what we have right now. What we have right now is more of a cobot, uh, something that is uh, a computer-aided robotic device designed to assist a person. So uh, you know in some of these movies, it's uh, the robot is fully um, un autonomous and doing all the work by itself, but that's not what we have. Right now, what we have is a basically a very expensive drill guide. So here is a picture video of how it works. It gets you in the trajectory, uh, but you still as a surgeon have to put in uh, the screw uh, by yourself. Um, and so that's what we currently have. Um, and so whenever you have a new technology, you have this, what we call a hype cycle. So there's a lot of excitement that happens and then you start having some negative press. Uh, I think that some people in the United States may have seen that there was uh, recently a warning uh, to one of the, uh, robotic companies uh, about uh, their technology. And so you start having some uh, negative press and then you start uh, having some problems and then maybe you reach some type of uh, equilibrium where we figure out, okay, this is the best application uh, for this technology. Uh, if we look at the chasm of uh, implementing a new technology, there's usually this uh, gray zone, whether we're gonna cross that chasm. And this, whether you cross this chasm, I think depends on how low this disappointment is. So if this disappointment is very, very low, uh, then you may not cross that chasm. Um, and so traditionally, sometimes we have this uh, um, thing where we start thinking about us versus them. So man versus machine. So uh, some of the younger people uh, may not know who Gary Kasparov is. I asked one of the residents, they had no idea, but I'm old enough to remember this. Uh, so uh, Gary was uh, playing against uh, this deep blue uh, IBM uh, computer, and you can see the stress on his face because he felt that it, he had the world, the, the pressure of the world on him. This was in 1997. If you uh, fast forward for 20 years, uh, you see that he uh, preaches a different uh, uh, scripture now. Now he says, you know, machines have calculations. We have understanding. Um, and so we actually should not look at the machines and robotics and so on as a uh, adversary, but rather um, something to help us uh, achieve our, 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 our goals. Um, so if we look at, you know, what's going to be the ideal navigation or imag uh, uh, imaging system, uh, we've had uh, brilliant talks by uh, my colleagues. Uh, we really want to have real-time imaging. We want to avoid fixating on the patient. Um, if we can avoid a preoperative CT, that would be great. We should be able to recalibrate easy. I love the work that uh, Dr. Mirza was doing uh, with the ultrasound. We want to re decrease radiation and we should not increase OR time. Right now, uh, the current iteration of robotics don't do any of the top four, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It's just that that's the iteration that we have right now. Uh, so can we use the robot for applications other than placement of pedicle screws? Um, so one of the great things about a robot uh, is that it is able to target deep structures um, and it, it could do that while decreasing the damage to overlying tissues, and we don't have to do a lot of dissection. Uh, so we use this actually to uh, uh, target Camden's triangle. I had a previous uh, webinar this morning on Camden's triangle. Um, and so uh, we can see that Camden's triangle can be a very 
deep space and it can be very, very small. And to target it uh, could be very tricky, but we've used the robot actually for this application. So here's a patient, 64 year old uh, gentleman who had previous problems with general anesthesia, did not wanna have general anesthesia. Uh, and he had a, a spondylolisthesis uh, at L5S1. So we're able to uh, target uh, the pedicles using the robot, but then also target Kamban's triangle. So then we're able to place an intrabody fusion uh, using this. Uh, we do this uh, um, ESP block as well as a spinal anesthesia. Uh, we have the patient awake uh, and then we put in the screws uh, traditionally, and then we're actually able to um, target Kamban's triangle. Uh, and so you can see in this case here, there's no blood loss, it's a percutaneous case. Uh, and these patients in general do very well. Uh, we publish a case series about this uh, using the robot to do that. Uh, and we can see that, you know, we had 10 cases, four of them were done awake. Our EBL, because it's percutaneous, is less than 100 cc's. And you can see now our, most of our length of stays are, is in zeros and ones. Uh, how about percutaneous iliac fixation? Uh, this for tumors and unstable sacral fra uh, pelvic fractures. Uh, so here's a gentleman who had an uh, invasive colorectal carcinoma. Uh, he had this very uh, metastatic and large uh, uh, cancer here. Um, and then if you look very carefully at a CT scan, uh, he had this uh, sacral insufficiency fracture here. Um, and so, you know, um, how do you treat this patient? He has very uh, bad kind of prognosis, but he has a lot of pain. So uh, what we do now is we can uh, uh, plan the screws uh, in, the, in the lumbar spine. And then this is where I think the real power of the robotics is, is that you can actually plan the tulip heads all line up together underneath the skin. Uh, and so uh, then you can do these cases percutaneous. So these are the Wiltsy incisions that we did for the lumbar screws. And then this incision here is for the iliac screw that went in this way. Um, and so it always is very uh, challenging when I'm doing it with fellows. They're like, oh no, Dr. Abdul-Bar, there's something wrong. And I tell them, no, it's nothing wrong. Uh, what happens is underneath the skin, uh, the tulip heads uh, line up. And this is very difficult to do uh, as a human being. Uh, and so you can do this uh, case now, you know, this is our first case we ever did was 150 cc blood loss, but now we're gonna get down to 20 and 30 cc blood loss. And you know, our, our construct looks like everybody else's, but it's completely percutaneous. We can get this patient home post-op day one. Uh, you know, he only ended up living for three to four months uh, after his diagnosis, but at least he was, uh, we gave him some quality of life. Uh, how about unstable sacral fractures? Uh, these can be in terms of high velocity traumas, or uh, uh, old uh, people with insufficiency fractures and fragility fractures. So here's a 65-year-old uh, lady. Uh, she had a head-on uh, motor vehicle accident. A lot of these patients you know, have uh, deep vein uh, thrombosis, so you don't want to do a big uh, decompression because then you're going to have to put them on blood thinners and so on. So if we can do this all percutaneously, that, that would be great. You can see here just how comminuted her uh, sacral fracture is. Uh, so this is done in, in, in uh, coordination with our uh, trauma colleagues. So the, here they had an acetabular fracture. They do all this. And then we are kind of sometimes um, dodging their metal. So we can do this, again, uh, completely uh, uh, percutaneous, 25 cc blood loss, right? Uh, now we can put her on blood thinners faster. Uh, she's two years out and extremely happy uh, with her uh, abilities to walk and so on. Uh, I don't think we could have done this uh, any other way. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's challenging. They have uh, external fixation devices. They have two to three uh, transiliac, transsacral uh, uh, screws, uh, but we can still kind of uh, dodge, dodge metal there. So this is our uh, uh, original uh, case series, uh, and we've uh, uh, had some uh, really good uh, uh, um, results. We had one complication uh, that we had. Um, how about uh, the trans facet T lift? So, you know, we've been very obsessed with Camden's triangle, but as we've learned more, we've found that some people's Camden's triangle is just too small uh, to put a safe intrabody fusion there. And that's really gotten us to think about this trans facet pathway, which is keeping the facet joint in the middle of our uh, trajectory into the disc. Uh, we've uh, published this paper looking at uh, these different pathways. 
Uh, here's a case I, I think I showed at the previous webinar, 35 year old, we do this transfacet uh, pathway. Now we've actually set the table and we haven't done this yet in a human, but I hope uh, in the next few months where we've actually shown that you can dock the robot on the facet joint and hopefully use the robot then to do the interbody fusion uh, and do this uh, completely per percutaneous. So in terms of future directions, uh, I think intelligent decompression, uh, I think will definitely be there. Um, you know, uh, one of the things right now, the robotic uh, heart uh, technology is a little bit slow. So I, I call it sometimes uh, affectionately the slow bot. Uh, and I think I'm faster. I call myself the Mobot. Uh, but at some day, uh, the slow bot will get faster. Um, and then more versatile end effectors uh, are coming down uh, the pipeline. So just to conclude, I think uh, robotic surgery is an emerging and exciting field of spine surgery. Uh, spine surgery. I think uh, beyond placement of pedicle screws, I think there are a lot of other applications that the robot can be very helpful for. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much for your really interesting and a very nice presentation. Do we have some question about this topic? I think to... I have a question, if uh, if I can. Yes, so is a on the same way of the one of Salman. We know that uh, uh, the technology, especially at the beginning, uh, are very. Um, uh, I have a very high cost. In uh, your opinion, um, what m must be the um, the breaking even points of surgery to justify this technology? And uh, I mean, all the centers that pro, uh, that were, have uh, spine surgery may use this technology, or in your experience, there is some specific indication or a number of procedures that give uh, a cost effectiveness of this uh, uh, technology as uh, right now is very very expensive yeah that's a that's a great question i think that uh, as it stands now uh, the robots are extremely expensive uh, they are very slow um, um, and so i think using them uh, for certain indications uh, makes sense i think that the um, indications that i like to use the robot for are uh, with these uh, spinal pelvic fixation where I can do everything percutaneously. I don't think that even the regular navigation will allow you to you know, really plan out and make it very precise where you put those tulip heads uh, and so that you can do these uh, cases uh, completely percutaneous, especially if there's previous instrumentation, you know, these uh, trans iliac screws that get in your way and so on. So you can really, you know, in, it has the advantage of amazing navigation, but then also the implementation is perfect, right? And so as we know, you know, just because you can plan it very well, doesn't mean as humans, we uh, implement it very well. Um, you know, so I, I use the robot uh, for uh, distinct cases, not all the time. I think for a one level or two level fusion, uh, the Mobot is still faster than the slow bot. Especially the sarcopelvic fixation uh, by the robot. But uh, as you have mentioned, uh, the way that we will use the robot is in the, uh, similar to the abdominal surgeons. Uh, in, in tumor resections, uh, even in uh, intradural tumor resections, do you think there will be a time uh, to come for this? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, I was doing uh, a very uh, difficult case a couple of days ago, uh, you know, where we have to do very precise dissection. And I told the resident, you know, do you think the robot uh, can do this? And currently no, right? And, and we can't lose our surgical skills. Uh, but I do think that in the future, that may be coming down the line. Uh, but uh, right now, the technology is just not there. Uh, I think we still need to learn how to dissect soft tissue and so on. Uh, but uh, maybe maybe in the future, it will happen. Dr. Teresa, yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Thank, thanks so much. Um, it, that was a great talk. Always fun to learn um, from you and fun to reflect on uh, being part of that hype period of the robot uh, training uh, with you and under you down at Duke. Um, my question was around your case on the spinal pelvic fixation. Two questions. One, um, with the Wilty incision, have you considered doing like a midline incision to the fascia um, just because those um, for the S2AI screws, the incisions are so medial compared to your uh, pedicle screw incisions. And then the second question was about fusion. So, you know, I'm getting tempted to use the robot to do this for like MIS, you know, T10 to pelvis, et cetera. Obviously, this was a very different case. It was more of a palliative surgery for someone for stabilization. Um, but are you comfortable at this point feeling like you get a good fusion to do it for more of a DGEN case? Yeah, great question. Um, so the first question about the Wiltsy, you know, that was our very first case. And uh, right now we're actually not doing Wiltsy's. You know, we're mostly uh, doing them as uh, uh, just percutaneous, uh, just stab incisions. So uh, usually, uh, you know, there isn't a need to to, to do midline. Um, and so um, I've kind of kind of gone away from that. So not a lot of times will I do uh, Wiltsy incisions, and uh, I think that was just our kind of our first kind of through the through the learning curve. Uh, in terms of fusion, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think that uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we've had uh, knock on wood, you know, some really good uh, um, experience with them in the traumatic uh, field. Uh, but in terms of, you know, for long segment fusions, are we going to be able to fuse across that segment or not? Uh, I don't know the answer to that at this point. Okay, well, uh, it's been a real pleasure having everybody uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, I think I've learned more than, uh, you know, I actually taught today and uh, it's so great to see people from all over the world. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Mehmet, for uh, setting this up. I think this is a great first start to the collaboration between the, uh, all the different uh, WFNS uh, committees. Really, that's great. great. Oh, yeah. I enjoyed all the speakers. Thanks a lot. You see you again. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.